Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what's good? Josh Coker here, AKA Joshman's Prime. You know what it is. Coming back at you with another video and we're jumping right back into part three of the Minotaur archetype. And in this section, we're going to discuss what I think is the most important part, which is the psychological <coughs> significance of this archetype and the role and function it plays in the story. So first and foremost, if you guys don't know what an archetype is, I'm gonna give you a brief explanation, but please watch my other videos that explain this in greater depth. Essentially an archetype is a character that is instantly recognized by, it's, it's like a character that's transcendent among human consciousness. So that no matter you know, where you live, whether you're on the east uh, of the, whether, whether you, you live in the Far East or you live in America or you live in South America or you live in Europe or wherever you live, you see it and you identify it. It it's, goes beyond culture, it transcends, transcends culture, language, all of those things because it has a psychological significance and this is one of the reasons why this archetype has lasted the test of time, we'll say. Um, the first thing to say, and I've mentioned this before in the other two videos, is that the Minotaur is a subclass of what I call the dragon archetype. I, I think that is the, the main archetype. You, you could say it's the monster archetype, but to me, monsters have a little bit lesser of a psychological significance, but the dragon arch archetype has, um, the, and all of its subclasses have uh, a much larger significance psychologically, and their function and roles are more important. And it's kind of the difference between, you know, a monster could be henchmen of the dragon archetype, which would be the the main boss or a mini boss or something to that extent. So first let's talk about the dragon archetype very, very quickly. Most of the, the dragon archetype is a stage archetype and because the minotaur archetype is a subclass of the dragon archetype, that means it too is a stage archetype. What does that mean for you as a storyteller? If you have no idea what is the difference is between a stage and a role archetype. That means that it's unlikely that this character is going to be found throughout the entire story. It may be referenced. There may be references to this Minotaur character in the story, but you won't get many scenes of it and the hero won't really confront it until the descent into darkness. And we're going to discuss, well, we'll discuss the stage now. Let, let me think about this. Do I want to discuss the stage? No, we'll discuss the stage will be the next part. Right now, we're just going to stick with the psychological significance and the functions. But the, the hero will go into a descent into darkness. And we'll discuss that in length in the next video. But when it does, it then faces essentially this monster of great power. Now this power is really dependent on the story you're telling and the world that you're in. So for example, if you're in a in an urban romance story, then this monster could be a grandmother that has um, great power over the hero and is telling the hero that men are no good and you don't need them and you're or maybe maybe she's saying you know it maybe she's saying you're uh, you're no good for that guy or he's out of your league or it could be of several different variations but in this sense you know the monster th this minotaur creature which in an urban romance, it would be hard to depict anybody as a uh, as a minotaur creature, unless maybe it's like Halloween and she's dressed up like this for a party, and then because then the symbolism is still there. But um, 
in a science fiction story, it it could be a uh, a robot minotaur that's found in the the evil robots labyrinthian lair or something like that that's hiding in space. And then fantasy, well, the fantasy version could be much more reflective of the the mythological version. The point is the hero is going to face this individual at essentially the midpoint of the story at the crisis point aka the crucible point okay this is not the climactic battle this is the the big battle where the hero sort of faces is their internal flaw and that is the most important thing about both the dragon archetype and the sub archetype of the minotaur is that it represents in some way a flaw of the hero and that flaw of the hero is also usually depicted of a flaw of society and so the more you can have that symbolism in there and let's go back to the story I told you earlier of the of the the Greek myth of the Minotaur which is the most famous the most long-lasting and if you think about it it, it was King Minos, it was his sin that led to all of this happening, uh, that led to angering the gods and creating this monster that he then had to hide away, and he's trying to hide away his sin, and he won't own up to it, and so it's all reflective of the, the, the sins of man, and that that is psychologically speaking where the the dragon archetype but especially the minotaur archetype really shines is that um, the reason why it has this animalistic type of depiction is because you can use the animal to really depict depict uh, the characteristics of the flaw and and show that there's something perverse about what society is doing and, and reflect it in that monster. And so, and, and if you can tie it even more into the hero's backstory and inner journey, that'll make it even, even that much more powerful. So, if you, if you consider that, you know, as I said in the last video about the prototypical physical attributes of a minotaur, you, you usually have a cow, a bull's head, and then a man's body, but you could go really wild with it. And I, and I mentioned earlier that some other offshoots of this minotaur archetype are things like, if you look at the Greek, or not the Greek, if you look at the Egyptian gods, you have, uh, you know, half hawk, half body, half man's body, half um, jackal, half man's body. It really depends on what the symbolism is that you're trying to go with. Maybe you could have half snake's head or half shark head, and it, maybe it's underwater or something like that. That is really entirely up to you, and that's where you can get really uh, creative with it. But each of those different variations is going to put a little bit of a different um, spin in the unconscious, in the unconscious of the sorry, in the subconscious of your audience and that's what you want you want to connect with their subconscious so that they really resonate with the story and um, I'm trying to think usually we'll, we'll discuss this more in in the next part but um, this creature this minotaur is going to be found in a dark dungeon like place a labyrinthian type of place and I'll explain that in the next video. But um, the more that you can have the hero kind of see themselves in this creature, and this is this is probably the final thing. You know, the hero will fight this creature, and the creature is super powerful physically. And to defeat it, it might even require the hero to do something non-physical to defeat it, something intelligent. Now I know in the original story you have um, Theseus just sneaks a sword in 
and then fights the monster and defeats it. But you can be more creative than that. And I've seen a sort of, I mean, I don't think this was super creative, but in Clash of the Titans, I think it was two, Perse, the character Perseus, they kind of totally mucked up the, the mythology, but Perseus goes into the labyrinth, fights a minotaur, and basically breaks off his horn and then uses the horn to kill it. And that's pretty cool. Usually after a dragon or monster or minotaur is killed in this stage or area, the hero will either, it, the hero will do a, one of a few things. The hero will eat the monster. The hero will drink the monster's blood to get its power. The hero will burn the monster or take pieces of its body in order to create some magical artifact. And so you guys might be saying, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. So for example, when, um, when I think it's Perseus in the original myth, when Perseus kills Medusa in order to take her head, which she can then use to destroy the Kraken or defeat the Kraken, that is a good example of what I'm talking about. So you could use the same thing for the Minotaur in your story, and maybe once you defeat, once your character defeats the Minotaur, you have to remove the horns and create some sort of weapon with it, or mash them up into Minotaur horn dust in order to create a special potion that fights vampires. I don't know, but um, that is an example and that's where you can go with it. And, but the, the psychological significance is the hero goes into this dark place to face his innermost demons that are also representative of the society's sins. And he has to overcome those demons by being somewhat clever. And this, is, this would also be good. I talk about this in other videos. Um, the hero should have been introduced to a psychological center, which is a truth that will help him overcome his flaw and reach his fullest potential. So if this psychological truth can be used to defeat the monster, that is a very powerful way to really hit home thematically your point of what you're trying to show. So, um, and I'll give you another example. Um, going back to the Gorgon example with Medusa, when when Perseus holds up the mirror to Medusa and that's what ends up defeating her, um, that is very symbolic of a couple things. Like the mirror shows in a symbolic way that Medusa is a mirror image of man and all of man's sins and, and the grotesqueness of man. And that's another thing I should bring up. The, the dragon archetype and all of its subclass archetypes, including the Minotaur, represent the grotesqueness of man. So the, the monster that they fight in this particular area, the Minotaur really should not be some fey looking beautiful Minotaur. It should be a gross, stinky, smelly, disgusting monster, bloodthirsty, all of that. And uh, another good example, when you think of the dragon, uh, I'm not gonna go into depth, I've went with other videos, but think of Smaug from um, The Hobbit. That's a good example of a creature that represents inner flaws of the hero. Uh, let's see. So the hero defeats the creature, using their psychological truth or some clever way to defeat the creature. And then by defeating the creature, they can then use the creature's power in order to do something else. And this sometimes is represented as the boon, meaning that once you defeat the creature, you get this reward, or you defeat the creature, you get its power or whatever, and then you have access to the boon, which is the, the greater thing like Jason's Fleece or something like that. So hopefully this has been helpful and stay tuned for part four where we'll discuss the stage in much greater detail and how the hero gets propelled into this stage. Okay, take it easy.